a very warm welcome. You're joining us at Hyde Park tonight and of course a different setting, uh, maintaining social distancing and required regulations um, surrounding the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic. We thought of discussing today about Sri Lankans abroad. Sri Lankan expatriates overseas seeking to return to the country and also most importantly Sri Lanka's foreign policy, uh, how Sri Lanka will balance our superpowers including what's ongoing around the world. Um, but before I introduce our speaker, our guest at Hyde Park tonight, I thought of also reminding you that Sri Lanka is in the process of uh, uh, formulating our foreign policy. For the first time in the history of Sri Lanka, a policy in the making, a written policy. A warm welcome to Admiral Professor Diana Kolumbage, who is Sri Lanka's Foreign Secretary. Thank you, Indivari. I'm happy to be with you here. Thank you very much. I thought it will be um, quite pertinent to discuss all this with you because you're also a professor in international relations. So I thought maybe we'll keep uh, the talk about COVID-19 for uh, the latter part of our discussion. Sri Lanka is uh, in the process of uh, formulating our foreign policy, as I said, revamping our policy. Mm -hmm. And this is for the first time that we're having a written down policy, a policy that will come in a hard copy. Yes. Where are we heading? Um, well, Indivari, if you look at uh, Sri Lanka's foreign policy and international relations uh, since independence in 1948, now we have come like uh, 72 years after that. And uh, I think in, on some instances, Sri Lanka has really done extremely well in international scene, though we are considered a small country. Mm -hmm. We have really kept our mark. But now we need to look back and see whether our foreign policy has really helped Sri Lanka, uh -huh. the people of Sri Lanka. So that is why this president has three pillars of his uh, vision for the country. Number one is national security, utmost importance, uh -huh. national security. I also believe that nothing can be achieved unless we have security. No matter what we plan, unless we have security, and we know what happens when we don't pay sufficient attention to national security. The Pasco, the Easter bombing is one clear example where we fail to give due uh -huh. consideration and prominence to national security. And President's second pillar is economic development. Now economic development is a very all-encompassing, very broad canvas right economic empowerment now 72 years after independence where are we economically you know we have been moving up and down from uh, middle income to lower middle income you know we have not really progressed the way we should have done right that is why the president is determined on economic development now his third policy which, which is of critical importance to me and that is the foreign policy so he has these three pillars quite interlinked, I would say, national security, economic development and foreign policy. Now we are in a transition because we, as, as I explained in the beginning, we have been very good in international political diplomacy. We have had our great uh, diplomats working in uh, multilateral fora, international fora. So generally we have been very good in international political diplomacy. And I would say we have been very weak in economic diplomacy. Oh. In the very now I have experience in this job and my previous job for the last one year. Oh. And I'm amazed about these ambassadors who are in Colombo, the outside uh -huh. countries in right. Colombo, they always talk business. Uh -huh. They come out, they come with a proposal, they come with a suggestion, they come with uh, a package, and they are, I would say, canvassing to promote business for their country. Is this why we are looking at our ambassadors and uh, our own diplomats yes. to be placed in respective countries exactly. to, uh, to, to bring business into the, uh, mainly, into the island? Mainly, yes. So what I wanted to say is, mm -hmm. but unfortunately, we have not given prominence to that. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. right? So therefore, we need a huge transformation from international political diplomacy to economic diplomacy. Now, economic diplomacy is something very different. Mm -hmm. You really have to market your country, mm -hmm. the products, the exports, the, the, uh, the, the ability to get into the job market, right. getting scholarships, getting technology, getting foreign direct investment from that country. Mm -hmm. So economic diplomacy is very different. So where does India stand? Uh, uh, the Indian well, okay, stand I'll come here. to that. Like India is also part of that economic diplomacy mm -hmm. because India is our neighbor mm -hmm. with a huge population, mm -hmm. nearly 1.34 billion, mm -hmm. and with a, a young population of 900 million. That means a huge market. Mm -hmm. So India is one of our main trading partners. Mm -hmm. So even with India, this economic diplomacy is of utmost importance. Mm -hmm. So what I wanted to say is in this transformation mm -hmm. from international political diplomacy to economic diplomacy, we have to redefine mm -hmm. our rules. We have to redefine our criteria. We have to redefine our policy. So that is what you referred to and that is what we are doing. We have designed a very simple, easy to understand 20 points. But is there a definitive direction in which uh, we yeah, will be it's heading? Out of these 20, about 9 talk about economic diplomacy. Mm -hmm. We talk about everything. We talk about remaining non-aligned, neutrality, not to be caught in the power game, all that. But nearly 50% of these 20 are focusing towards economic diplomacy and this will be the guiding principles for our foreign missions and the foreign ministry mm -hmm. to work. Mm -hmm. Now again in the very having directives is one thing, but then how are we going to measure? That's another thing. So we want tangible, mm -hmm. measurable results from our missions abroad because we spend a lot of money. Right. You know, to maintain, to maintain. a mission, mm -hmm. we spend a lot of money. Of course it is needed. But then what is the return we get? That's the question we have been asking, mm. not me, much, much before people have been asking. Are we getting the best cost benefit? The answer, unfortunately, is not quite. So we want to change that. So we, we want to develop this. Uh, it is not yet promulgated. It is a work in progress. But very soon we will uh, 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 put it to the cabinet and get their consent right, right. and then it will be implemented mm -hmm. and that will be the guiding principles for our foreign missions to work with measurable tangible results. So when we talk about measurable tangible results, I heard you say recently that Sri Lanka will have an India first policy too. Well, I would say, although I used that word in that particular interview, I would now say it is Sri Lanka first. Right? Of course, you know, what I meant by saying India first in that interview was, you see, India and Sri Lanka are geographically very close, mm -hmm. you know, across the Pork Strait mm -hmm. and the Gulf of Mana, we are separated by about 24 kilometers. Mm -hmm. That's a very short distance between two countries. Now, if you take a ship in India, okay. if they want to go from one coast to the other, they have to go around Sri Lanka, mm -hmm. right? And if it is an aircraft, within less than two minutes, it can cross to each other's mm -hmm. airspace, mm -hmm. right? Now that means Sri Lanka is pretty much part of India's maritime and air security umbrella. That's the fact geography has given us. So we have, we don't have luxury of becoming a strategic security concern to India. Uh, with the recent high-powered uh, Chinese delegation's visit in Sri Lanka and also the expected visit of the U.S. Secretary of State, how do you think India will look at this? What's the well, in India, of course, we have sent, uh, we have extended an invitation from Indian Foreign mm -hmm. Minister also to come mm -hmm. uh, for whatever the, uh, some uh, domestic reasons he could not make it. Mm -hmm. So we hope that uh, he will also come. Uh, now, these high-level visits. Oh, bef before you also continue answering that, Admiral, why the sudden surge of uh, high-powered visits of our, uh, to our country of superpowers? One may want to know. Well, I think the simplest answer is the growing importance of the Indian Ocean 
for global trade and global security and global economic purposes. Indian Ocean in 21st century is fast becoming the key ocean in the world. If you look back 19th and the 20th centuries, it was the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Oceans which played a crucial role in world affairs. Whether it is the world wars, whether it is the industrial revolution, whether it is the free market economies, whether it is globalization, whether it is technology re revolution, everything happened in the Pacific and the Atlantic. But in the 21st century, that has already shifted towards the Indian Ocean. Mm -hmm. So therefore, the Indian Ocean is of critical importance to the world today. And that is why everyone is focusing on the Indian Ocean. And then to be specific about your question, Sri Lanka is in the center of the Indian Ocean. And that also puts Sri Lanka in a very geopolitically tight spot, yes. in a very important strategic location, mm -hmm. but also uh, which makes Sri Lanka, um, which, which makes it more and more important for Sri Lanka to have a stringent foreign policy. We'll talk more about this once we return after this short break. Where joining you via Hyde Park on Other Derana 24. Welcome back. Um, Admiral Columbia, I think uh, you also did mention that Sri Lanka cannot uh, remain a, a geopolitical football field mm. for major countries. But we were talking about how important Sri Lanka is in this present context, given the uh, increasing importance of uh, the Indian Ocean region and also superpowers vying for this strategic location and, its, uh, and trying to exert its power and influence. But when we talk about Sri Lanka, how are we going to manage these uh, geopolitical uh, issues, also the superpowers, because we see China and the United States increasing its powers, and also India's concern. But uh, if they are at each other, China and the United States, what what role will Sri Lanka play? What will our stance be? I presume you look at all these. Yeah, of course, in the very because, uh, as I mentioned, in the Indian Ocean, Sri Lanka is in the center. If you look from the distance from the eastern border of the Indian Ocean to the west, we are in the center. If you look at the distance from Shanghai to Rotterdam, we are in the center. Look at the distance from Singapore to Dubai, we are in the center. And also, we are very importantly, we are south of India. Now, India is the big country with a huge population, fastest growing economy in the region, the biggest military in the region, and we are there. Now, our central location in the Indian Ocean is attracting this attention mm -hmm. from the major and aspiring major powers in the Indian Ocean. I remember Admiral Harry Harris, who was the Pacific commander a few years ago, when he addressed a meeting in Colombo, he said Sri Lanka has three distinct advantages, location, location and location, <laughs> right? So this means our location is the focus of attention of all the major powers. And if you look at the Indian Ocean geopolitical, geoeconomical, and geostrategic competition that you rightly mm -hmm. mentioned, Sri Lanka is in crossroads, mm -hmm. or Sri Lanka is in the spheres of influence of all the major players, whether it is USA, India, China, Japan, Australia, EU, Sri Lanka is in that sphere of influence. Mm -hmm and their focus of attention crisscross this small country. Mm -hmm. So many people, or rather many powers, they want to make Sri Lanka may not be a football field, but a battleground. Now we should be consciously avoiding that to happen. So this is why our foreign policy talks about neutrality. Mm -hmm. While we remain a non-aligned country, we want to remain neutral. We want to stay away from the <coughs> power game consciously. We don't want to be caught up in this power game. Whilst we maintain neutrality and stay away from the power game, we need to maintain friendly relations with every nation as, as a sovereign country. And while we maintain friendly relations with other countries, we want to develop economic relations with all prospective countries. While we do this, we have to be mindful about India's strategic security concerns. Now, if these five cannot be met perfect balancing, we will lose the game. 
So we are determined to make this work while staying trying to stay away from the competition, maintain our neutrality, maintain friendly relations with everyone, maintain economic relations because in the very the fact of the matter is 72 years after independence our economy is in a very bad shape. Why? There are many answers. Bottom line is we haven't done very well with our economy. Bottom line is that. Uh, when we talk about all this, what comes to mind uh, is that uh, Sri Lanka has had a non-aligned policy. We've continuously uh, spoken about neutrality in the global uh, political and diplomatic arena. But uh, it has been difficult for Sri Lanka. We have been caught up in this diplomatic power play. But how will we try to navigate through these challenges? Because in the past, we've seen India, China, and the US factor also you know in this scenario and we have found it very difficult to balance it but from a battlefield from a, a football field to a balancing game how do we shift this yeah you're right I mean we are a non-aligned country mm -hmm. but in the very look at the world today now when we say non-aligned against what you know when the non-alignment movement was created in the uh, 70s there were two clearly identifiable power blocks in the world, right? We had the US-led NATO and the Western European countries in one block. And then we had USSR and the Warsaw Pact countries with the Eastern European countries in another block. Okay. So there were clearly identifiable two blocks. Mm -hmm. So at that time, many countries like Sri Lanka, we created the non-alignment movement. Mm -hmm. Now, what is non-alignment today? It has lost its real meaning when it was created. So that is why we have added it. I mean, while we remain a non-aligned country, we want to maintain our neutrality. And you hit the spot. You said from time to time, although we are a non-aligned country, if you look back at the history, if you take the periods of decades, you know, 10 years, 10 years, or five years, 10 years, you see we have tilted or we have moved away from non-aligned policy and we have moved towards one country or the other. Which may have threatened certain superpower against the other. And then we have lost. You know, every time we did that, we have retarded our progress and we have conflicts in the country. So we don't have the luxury of selecting a particular country against another particular country. That is why we want to maintain the neutrality and maintain friendly relations with everyone so that we are not caught up in the power game. It's a very difficult balancing act, but that's the only way for us to do. You've also spoken about a comprehensive maritime policy. How do we go about this? Well, you see, now, if you take the Indian Ocean, if you take the region, mm -hmm. there are many maritime security-oriented strategies. You see, if you like look at the America, they have the Indo-Pacific strategy. If you look at Japan, they have free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. And if you look at ASEAN countries, they have ASEAN centrality in Indo-Pacific strategy. If you look at India, they have Sagar, security and growth fall in the region, neighborhood, look is many policies. Now, in the very ways, our policy. That is the question that we need to ask. In this gamut of strategic policies, governing or concerning Sri Lanka and the region, where is our policy? So therefore, now uh, let me also add, Sri Lanka is a land area of 65,000 square kilometers, which is not growing. Our population is growing. That means the resources on the land is depleting. Mm -hmm. Our future lies in the blue ocean, in the water column, air above the water column and the seabed beneath it. That's where our future is, right? So unless we have a comprehensive maritime security strategy, we will have to react, we will have to dance to the tunes of other strategies. So this is why I emphasize that we need to come out with our own comprehensive, the word comprehensive means all encompassing. Usually, usually when you hear the word maritime strategy, somebody may think, oh, it's a navy mm -hmm. doing the guarding the ocean. That is, that's not maritime strategy. Maritime strategy for a country is much, much broader. It is about shipping. It is about trade. It is about ocean. It is about scientific research. 
it is about exploiting the seabed resources mm -hmm. for the benefit of the country and ocean is our future and we need a very clearly definable comprehensive strategy to make our dreams work. Welcome back. Talking about the ocean and the recent um, incident, the accident with the new mm -hmm. diamond, uh, whose decision was it to remove the vessel from Sri Lankan waters? What, what, what was the tussle uh, between the authorities in this? Well, there was no tussle because it was uh, an accidental fire mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. uh, started in uh, MT New Diamond. It is a very large crude carrier which carried uh, nearly 200 millions of crude oil. And very fortunately that the fire started in the engine room and the Sri Lanka Navy, Sri Lanka Coast Guard reacted immediately mm -hmm. and the Sri Lankan Air Force came to support and then of course Indian Navy, Indian Coast Guard came and then the salver, the people who were the salvager, they all came mm -hmm. and due to combined effort we were able to extinguish the fire, mm -hmm. right? Now we took about a week to extinguish the fire and fortunately no major leak was observed from the crude oil it was carrying right. but there was little bit of uh, oil spill from the engine room mm. because we have been pumping a lot of water into the engine room and invariably some oil leaked out right now we had a situation we extinguished the fire we doused the fire mm -hmm. and now the vessel is waiting to leave right right now in the very this is the month of october now you see the weather how quickly it changed the wind became stronger, the, 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 the low pressure areas developed around Sri Lanka. So we did not want, I mean Sri Lankan government did not want to keep a damaged oil tanker with nearly 200 million metric tons in our close proximity to mm -hmm. our country. Mm -hmm. So we were really interested in getting it out of our waters as quickly as possible, having claimed the money we were due to we, we were supposed to get. But how do you respond to uh, statements that Sri Lanka should have uh, kept this vessel in Sri Lankan waters and continued to uh, receive about 25 million dollars in additional uh, services that we provide? Now this is an argument. Mm -hmm. Basically, Sri Lankan government received every sent its top. So uh, we have not paid. lost anything. We haven't it. lost anything. Mm -hmm. The Navy, Air Force, Coast Guard, MIPA. All the agencies, Ports Authority, recovered the money they spent. So okay. we haven't really lost anything, mm -hmm. right? Only thing is, now you ask, why didn't we keep the ship? Where? Do you think it is advisable to bring this ship into one of our harbors? Mm -hmm. Do you think it is advisable to bring this ship closer to our coast? What if there was a breaking of the ship and the oil spill take place? It would have been catastrophic. Right? That amount of money, you mentioned $25 million, but if the ship broke into two and if the oil leaked out, that damage cannot even be quantified. Right? So there was no requirement for us to keep the ship because you, uh, I mean, uh, in Devery, this is a ship, the engine room caught fire and there was a raging fire for about a week. Mm -hmm. You, you very well know when something is that heated, the metal around it can break. So we were not 100% sure the state of the metal of the ship. So we were very consciously trying to get, uh, trying our best. Having done the hardest work of extinguishing the fire, preventing a major oil spill, recovering all our money, mm -hmm. we were determined to get the ship to clear our territorial waters, our exclusive economic zone as quickly as possible because the monsoon is onsetting, the winds were changing, the ocean was becoming rough. Mm -hmm. Those were the criteria which led to that. Are, are there any um, estimates of uh, a damage caused to our uh, seabed, our ocean resources it is, as a result? Yeah. The damage caused to the environment is still being worked out mm -hmm. because it's not easy to work out the environmental damage because it's a scientific approach. They need to collect a lot of samples, not just then but over a period of time. Our MIPA, Marine uh, Environmental Protection Authority, is doing that. Mm -hmm. So this provision is there. If you can prove that there was a damage to your marine environment because of that mm -hmm. 
they are bound to pay. Now, uh, in the very another thing, the captain was taken to courts and he pleaded guilty. Mm -hmm. And there was a huge fine for that also. Mm -hmm. That money also we got. Right. So nothing I lost. I think on that note, we'll speak more. We are in discussion with the, the Foreign Secretary, Admiral Professor Jayanath Kolumbage, joining us at Hyde Park. Welcome back. You're joining us at Hyde Park. Um, Admiral Columbia Gay, I think um, repatriations of Sri Lankans overseas uh, um, have been halted owing to the ongoing COVID-19 risks. But what is the process now? We know that there is a por portal that was set up for them to register, mm -hmm. but many are awaiting a return to Sri Lanka. But at the same time, there's a massive risk. There is a risk to be mm -hmm. contained within the country. What's the process in place? Yeah, in the very uh, soft now, we have brought two the country mm -hmm. during the COVID period, if we say starting from 1st of February, right. where we brought 34 students from Wuhan, if you remember, right? That's the start mm -hmm. we did. And then, of course, then thereafter, the other students, pilgrims, and all other categories. Yes. To date, we have brought 44,000 people from 126 different countries in the world. Right. Now, this is despite the fact our airspace is technically closed, yes. and many airports and air uh, spaces in other countries are also closed because every country is having very stringent measures. So we have done that and we were planning to continue to the, do that but unfortunately the Minuangada COVID cluster came uh, while we were almost confident that we didn't have anything in the society we can bring more numbers back to Sri Lanka right now the, our problem is there are certain limiting factors number one the uh, accommodation available in the quarantine centers mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because of the Minuangoda cluster our quarantine centers are full right right overwhelmed then the second one is the number of hospital facilities to treat if a person is COVID positive that is also full at the moment the third factor is the capacity to do PCR testing and I think we are doing maybe about four to five thousand tests per day now these three have restricted our bringing in people from abroad now we have done 44,000 but if you ask me a figure another 50,000 plus people are waiting to come okay. to Sri Lanka mm -hmm. we have to bring them there are no two words about it we have to bring them but only thing is two conditions have to be met number one that they should not give the COVID to anyone in Sri Lanka right. because we have had large number of important cases okay. even to date uh, the highest number of cases in Sri Lanka are or were imported cases. Mm -hmm. So th we sh they should not bring the COVID to anyone in the society and they should be safe when they arrived in the country from our community. Which means they have to undergo respective uh, everything. quarantine and health and safety guidelines. Everything according timeline. to the health protocol, the PCR testing, uh, 14 days, 14 days quarantine. quarantine and then we advise another 14 days home quarantine mm -hmm. to be double sure. So we have to look at both. We can't jeopardize the lives of Sri Lankans living in Sri Lanka and we cannot forget the people who are abroad which are I mean who are bringing large number of a large amount of foreign exchange to the country very valuable contribution to our economy so we will we are waiting until we get the green light until the situation stabilize here to start the repatriation uh, there were rumors rather vigorous ones that uh, the Minuangura cluster uh, was a result of an imported uh, virus foreign cases as you said uh, how how do you talk, look at this i mean what have you got to say well, or to put put these rumors to bed no, i mean only thing i can say is when we discovered the minuangoda cluster i think the fifth of this month for the before like 70 80 days before we did not have a single case in our community mm. that means our community was covid free right all the covid cases were coming from the quarantine centers right but then somehow somewhere there had been some leak right now it has to be from abroad because we didn't have it in our society so that is the argument it has to be from abroad but we don't have a conclusive idea as to the origin of it I think the army, the state intelligence services, the health services, mm -hmm. they are studying it, they are carrying out research as to how this came, mm -hmm. right? We know somehow it has come uh, and it has to be from a foreign, uh, I mean, uh, imported case, but we don't know exactly what 
Mm -hmm. Over. What's the present policy, Foreign Secretary, on letting foreigners into the country? Well, you see, there are different categories mm -hmm. of foreigners coming into the country. One is the people working in our, mm -hmm. I mean, Sri, in Sri Lanka, diplomatic missions, the foreign diplomatic missions in the country. And there are international organizations, and there are foreign workers, consultants in our country working. And this category, gradually, we are going to permit them mm -hmm. to come. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't come, you know, we cannot move ahead with our economy because the projects need to be completed, right? Whether it is the Port City project, project whether it is the Umayya project, whether it is the water purification project, whether it is the road network, mm -hmm. there are a lot of foreigners working in the country, mm -hmm. right? In telecommunication. So we need them to come back in groups in, in about a week's time because they are needed for this country and then the foreign missions, the international uh, the, uh, missions here. So we permit them to come uh, in small groups. Right. Uh, I'd also like to talk a little about the UNHRC matter, although we may have forgotten the question of UNHRC and allegations against Sri Lanka as a result of COVID-19. But a British, uh, before I go there, a British tribunal ruled against the ban on the LTTE. Will there be dialogue with the British government uh, pertaining well, to Well, it's, it's not they really ruled out. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the British Home Ministry mm -hmm. uh, continue the proscription of the LTTE. Mm -hmm. And the LTTE or the, the uh, we call the PGTE, they file a case in UK against that ruling. So the court has said the technicality, the procedure mm -hmm. of continuing the proscription by the, their home ministry is wrong. Mm -hmm. So that is now I think it is up to the government, UK government, uh, to make corrections mm -hmm. to that observation mm -hmm. and if they really believe that it should be proscribed for another period, now the onus is on the British government. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I mean we have uh, brought this to the notice of uh, the, the UK mission here and also the Sri Lankan mission in UK and uh, because we believe we have enough evidence to uh, say that the uh, the LTTE ideology and the attempts are still continuing to uh, create violence in the country. Uh, so we will continue to monitor the situation and how the UK government reacts to that situation. Of course, we were not party to that uh, case, but it is very much interest to us. Uh about the constitutional amendment uh, and uh, Sri Lanka's approach in the constitution making the 20th amendment in the offing, um, a recent uh, discussion uh, with uh, between the Indian Prime Minister and his Sri Lankan counterpart here, 13A was heavily touched on by the Indian side. Does our foreign policy also in, uh, affect our constitutional making process? Will there be an impact uh, even if we consider uh, whether it's Sri Lanka first or India first? Will that have an impact? Well, uh, in the very, to give you a very brief answer, the 13th Amendment came in 1987. That was nearly 32 years before. 32 years before, right? And I think we all know that is not something we wanted. It was kind of, uh, you know, given to us to implement. And the 13th Amendment to me had two objectives. One thing is to, uh, one thing is to stop violence, right? and to develop the provinces, to stop violence, I mean 87, and to develop the provinces. Now when you look back and see whether any of the things achieved, the answer is no. It did not stop the violence, the war dragged on till 2009, and it did not develop the two provinces in reference, that is the North and East, right? So in the 13th Amendment, things have been already implemented, practiced, like we have the uh, Provincial Council, we have a Chief Minister, we have a Provincial Secretary, there are budgetary allocations, mm -hmm. but there are certain things which cannot be implemented because the people have rejected these, like land powers and police powers, right? And many feel that we are a small country, we cannot have different police powers or different police forces in the country, uh, we can't have it. So 13th Amendment has been very old, mm -hmm. right? So I, I, I But think this continues to be taken up at not the by political us. fora by yeah. the Indian by side. India because India is interested mm -hmm. in it because they created it, it. I mean, they were architect in that. And of course, uh, they are concerned about their own population in the, in the Tamil Nadu. I think the central government of India will have to listen to the uh, sentiments of their people in the south, 
South India and also there is a connection to Sri Lanka as well. So nothing wrong in their being concerned about it, but uh, it is not uh, something that we want. U.S. Secretary of uh, State Mike Pompeo's expected mm -hmm. visit. Uh, what are we uh, looking at discussing with uh, the U.S. high-level delegation? Well, I think it will be a, a, a very important visit mm -hmm. because he is the senior most uh, U.S. state official uh, coming to the country after a very long time. And uh, despite the COVID situation, uh, a senior officials like that coming from U.S. is something really great. And also, I think there will be discussions on multilateral, bilateral issues, uh, trade, defense cooperation, trade, and economic cooperation, mm -hmm. and the Indian Ocean. Uh, mo most of these things will be uh, discussed. And India, uh, sorry, America is an important uh, trading partner. In fact, it is the biggest trading partner for Sri Lanka. Uh, so there has to be uh, more. Uh, opportunities, more avenues to be exploited in that sense to increase trade. Uh, I think our main focus will be how we can benefit economically. Because Sri Lanka has a bargaining power here being a strategic yeah, the location. 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 Uh, but not at the sacrifice of our sovereignty or our integrity. Not at the sacrifice of that. And how do we uh, address the human rights issue? Will that be taken up uh, uh, with uh, Mike Pompeo during his well, visit? Well, we, we really do not know. And I have a feeling they may not take it up because we, they just finished the Geneva uh, the session a few weeks ago. And uh, we feel these human rights allegations are totally unfair and unsubstantiated and highly unnecessary against Sri Lanka. So coming March 2021, we will have to face it again in Geneva. So we are making our preparation for that. And we are not giving up. We are not giving in. We are doing everything possible to make the reconciliation and all the other pledges that we made work. But it doesn't mean that somebody can pull a, point a gun at us and say, OK, reconcile now. Do that. It will never work in Sri Lanka. I have much more to talk to you, but I have very limited time. So finally, again about Pompeo, the U.S. Secretary of State. Uh, he has been uh, quite a vocal critic of Chinese investment in Sri Lanka under its Belt and Road Initiative. China dismisses these uh, claims of uh, putting Sri Lanka or any other nation into a debt trap. But how is Sri Lanka going to manage this situation? Well, I think the president, when he met the Chinese uh, uh, the, the one of member of the Politburo just a week ago, mm -hmm. He categorically said that there is no basis for the debt trap accusation. Mm -hmm. He said, we have taken loans, we have an issue, we have a, a debt issue in our country, but it is not because of China. And if you look at as a percentage from our total debt to China, we have about 10% of our external debt mm -hmm. is to China. So that's almost nothing. I mean, not, not nothing, but it's not the big, big chunk. We have more to be paid to IMF, bilateral lenders, multilateral lenders, Asia Development Bank, we have to pay more. And so it is not China, the, the, there is no debt trap. So President has been very clear about it and I'm sure he will maintain the same line that there is no debt trap. Thank you very much for your time here at Hyde Park. We had with us the Foreign Secretary Admiral Professor Jayanath Kolumbage joining us at Hyde Park on Other Derana 24.